get straight to the point. Hand over all the money. What? Money? Don't pretend you don't understand. I'm taking over the finances now. You? Handling the finances? You're just a sister-in-law. Don't overstep your bounds. You haven't been here in 10 years, so why now? Are you refusing to comply? Why would I follow your orders? You have no choice. Look at you, all confused. The moment I saw her smug, sneering face, something inside me snapped. Follow her orders? To this selfish woman? No way will I let her take my precious money in time. She'll regret this. My name is Susan. Last week, on my 65th birthday, my husband's health took a sudden turn for the worse, and he passed away. Since then, everything has been so hectic that I haven't had a moment to mourn. Today is finally the week. I stood there staring at my husband's peaceful face in the casket. I still can't believe this happened so suddenly. Just the other day, he was talking about how he wanted to start walking so we could enjoy traveling together in our retirement, or how he wanted to improve his cooking skills and ask me to teach him, or how he wanted to pick up photography again, which had been his hobby. He talked so cheerfully about wanting to study it again. We both believed we still had so many years ahead of us. I felt tears welling up and took a deep breath. I can't keep feeling down forever. I can't make him worry about leaving us. He'd be concerned about his mother, who has lived with us for years. But I promised him I would take care of her so he shouldn't worry. It seems unfair that he left before his mother, though. My mother-in-law, Lisa, has mild dementia. She repeats stories from the past and sometimes forgets things or mixes people up. Sometimes she acts like a child lost in her imagination or being stubborn. Her legs and back are weak, so she needs help with dressing and using the restroom. But I've been caring for her for seven years, so I'm used to it. Life with just me and she will surely be lonelier than before. But when it gets too lonely, I'll ask her to tell me stories of my husband's childhood. The funeral and cremation went smoothly. I finished all the remaining procedures and tasks, and my short break is over. I balance my part-time job, household chores, and taking care of Lisa. Life has returned to its usual routine. My husband was such a quiet and natural presence that it still doesn't feel like anything has changed. Lisa seems to be acting normal, but I think she's sadder than I am. She sits with an old photo album she pulled from the closet, talking to my husband as he was in her memories. On the days I go to work, I have a helper take care of her. It's only a few times a week, but it earns me some pocket money and serves as a break. Staying busy with work is better than being home all the time. I recently returned to work, completed my usual tasks, did some shopping before it got dark, and headed home. When I got home, I realized that I still shop as if my husband were here. I bought too much food. My husband was always a big eater, so now there are leftovers. And again, I feel that wave of loneliness. I'm home, I said quietly as I entered the house. It was so soft that Lisa couldn't hear it, so I didn't expect a response. But suddenly I heard a cheerful, unfamiliar woman's voice inside the house. Who could it be? Hello? Who's here? I called out, entering the house. It's me, Mary. Mary? How did she get in? Did she use a spare key? I've never given her a key before, so what is she doing here without notice? I wondered if it was an emergency, but she didn't seem worried. She was lounging on the sofa watching TV. My discomfort grew seeing her so at ease in my house. Uh, what are you doing in my house? I demanded. Do I need permission to come to my own family home? She replied with irritation. Shouldn't you at least call first? I wanted to say, but I held back. I came to check on things. She continued, ignoring my discomfort. I kept my mouth shut, trying not to escalate things. She's over 10 years younger than my late husband, still barely in her 40s, and sees herself as bubbly and sociable. But to me, she's loud and obnoxious. She's always clashed with my late father-in-law, which is why she left the house and cut ties when she got married. She didn't even attend to her father's funeral five years ago. I don't know why she hated him so much, but she suddenly showed up at my husband's funeral, making a scene by loudly reminiscing with friends and relatives. I heard rumors that she's bad with money, with some saying she even borrowed money behind her husband's back. I can see that being true. Where were you, Susan? She asked abruptly. I was at work, I replied. How could you leave mom alone in the house? Don't make it sound like that. I had a helper stay with her while I was out. Paying for a helper while you work a part-time job? Doesn't that defeat the purpose? You should just stay home and take care of mom yourself. I was taken aback. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I've balanced my part-time job in caring for Lisa for years. You left the house when you were young. Why do you suddenly care now? I retorted, feeling my frustration rise. I thought you'd be struggling now that John's gone, but you're already back to work. 
Do you even care about mom? What? You're shirking your duties as a daughter-in-law, she said coldly. I was shocked. Why was I being attacked like this? Now that John's gone, I'm worried about leaving the house and mom to you. The daughter-in-law, she continued. I was stunned. Why was she calling me just the daughter-in-law? Yes, John is gone, but I have my pension savings and enough to live comfortably. I've been caring for Lisa for seven years now. Her words were insulting. Since I came all this way, you should give me my share, she said holding out her hand. Your share? What are you talking about? My share of John's inheritance. I'm his sister, so half of it is mine, right? She said, shaking her hand as if asking for change. Half? Yes, half, she repeated, smirking. I think you're mistaken, I said firmly. You don't have a share of the inheritance. What? What do you mean? Siblings aren't entitled to inheritances. Unless there's no other family, I explained. And Lisa is still alive and well. But the house will be mine eventually, right? Mom has an inheritance share, doesn't she? Lisa is still alive, so there's no inheritance to discuss, I repeated. Well, she won't be alive forever, Mary snapped. When she's gone, this house will be mine, so you should leave. Mary's logic was twisted, but she did have a point. I remembered when my father-in-law passed. She refused her inheritance share due to bad relations and his business debts. I don't want any inheritance, she has said back then. I know there are debts. Just because I married into a wealthy family doesn't mean I have to pay them. Leave me out of it. Now here she was, suddenly interested because John was gone. I explained calmly that she had no claim, but the more I explained, the angrier she got. Just then, Lisa called for me from her room. I excused myself and went to help her, but when I returned, Mary was gone. I looked around and noticed several of Lisa's antique faces, which she cherished, were missing. When did this happen? Mary must have taken them. How dare she complain about inheritance and then steal from her own mother? I didn't want to believe it, but she was the only one here. Susan, what's wrong? Lisa asked, noticing my expression. Oh, Mary was just here. She said she was worried about us. Oh, really? She replied. Next time, make sure to tell me when she comes. Five days later, Mary showed up again without notice. This time, she brought movers with her and had piled up boxes outside the house. Mary, what's with all these boxes? I asked, panicking. She ignored me, directing the movers. Heavy things go inside, but be quiet. There's an elderly person here. Wait a minute, you can't just do this without asking, I protested, blocking the movers from entering the house. Isn't it obvious I'm moving in? Moving in? What about your own house? I demanded. I divorced my husband and came back here for the sake of this house, she declared. I was speechless. You divorced? Yes, last week, for the sake of this house, she repeated. You're moving in here? Of course, and I expect you to handle all the caregiving and housework. And you'll do what? Earn money? Help with expenses? That's not my job, she replied indignantly. Her words made no sense. I needed to calm down and think. Mary, what happened to Lisa's collection of vases? I asked, suddenly remembering. I sold them to cover moving costs, she said without a hint of shame. Sold them? Yes, it's my family's house. I can do what I want with what's inside, she said smugly. I was shocked into silence. I decided to get Lisa and let her know, but Mary stopped me. Wait, I'll tell her. It's better coming from me than a daughter-in-law. I realized she was scared of what Lisa would say. Mary pointed to John's study, still half-organized. Mary, please don't put anything in this room, I requested. Why not? I'm moving in, she retorted. It's a nice room with good sunlight. It might be your family home, but I've lived here for decades too. You can't just come in and take over without notice. Let's be clear. Hand over all the money, she demanded again. Money? What are you talking about? I asked, bewildered. The house is money. All of it, she insisted. What? All of it? That doesn't make any sense. I told you, as the rightful heir, I will manage everything from now on, she smirked. Are you out of your mind? I snapped. I'll tell you this now. I'm not listening to you. I said calmly. I'll leave this house immediately. See, my reaction, Mary's smile disappeared. What are you talking about? What will you do with mom? She demanded. Just as you said, I'm just the daughter-in-law. I'll leave everything to you now, I replied, grabbing my things and preparing to leave. Ah, what a heartless woman, Mary shouted after me as I left the house. Good luck handling everything now, I muttered under my breath. A week later, I had 50 missed calls on my phone. It was Mary. Susan, please help me, she begged when I finally answered. Help you? Why would I do that? We're family, aren't we? She insisted. Family? After all you've done? 
I replied coldly. I'm begging you, she sobbed. I don't know what to do. Maybe you should think about why you're in that situation, I replied. Please, she cried. Mom is so demanding, she keeps shouting orders at me. Oh, didn't you know? Her dementia has improved a lot, I said. Really? She said, surprised. I thought she was just staying quiet in her room. Oh no, she's been playing online games to stay sharp, I explained. Games? Mary sounded even more confused. Yes, ever since the helper suggested it, she's been getting better, I said. But she's so demanding! Mary wailed. Well, she has a lot of energy now, I replied. Lisa, do you have something to say to Mary? I called out. Yes, I heard everything. Don't be so high and mighty, Mary. Susan's been doing everything right. I smiled, knowing Lisa had my back. And by the way, I added, we're moving out tomorrow. You should leave too. Moving out? She gasped. Yes, we've sold this house, I explained. We're moving to a senior-friendly apartment. What? How could you sell this house without my permission? She yelled. It's Lisa's house, not yours, I replied calmly. You have no right to decide anything here. But this is my family home, she protested. Not anymore, I said firmly. Get out before you become an intruder, I added, my patience wearing thin. This isn't over. She screamed as she stomped out. Good luck, I said quietly as I closed the door behind her. Life will go on just fine without her. Isn't that old lady just annoying and in the way? Wouldn't it feel so much better if she wasn't around? I caught her in the act, causing trouble. And she just shamelessly justifies her actions. She's not just any part-timer. She brags that she's the daughter of a big shot at the head office, which makes it even worse. But Jessica doesn't understand. The person she's been picking on isn't just any old woman. After every storm, there's a rainbow. And I'm counting on that rainbow to appear in Jessica's dark cloud. I'm Karen Williams. I'm in my 40s and a housewife who loves frugal cooking. I got married in my 30s and my husband and I have two kids. When our youngest entered elementary school, I started working part-time at a local grocery store. Balancing work and home life was tough, but my husband helped out, so I managed to keep going. A few years after I started working, my hard work was recognized, and I was promoted to a full-time position through the employee promotion program. What began as a way to supplement our household income has now become much more. The full-time staff includes the manager, myself, and three kitchen staff. All other workers are part-time employees. Some work to earn pocket money. Others work to cover their children's extracurricular expenses. Among them, the oldest is Mary Johnson. I heard she recently returned 77, but she is incredibly lively. She doesn't necessarily look especially young, but she always exudes a certain dignity. Yet she never loses her smile. If she's really 77, she's older than my mom, but she doesn't look it. The younger part-timers call her Grandma Mary. It's short for Grandma Mary Johnson. I thought it was a bit rude, but she uses it herself sometimes, saying Grandma Mary can handle it. So I sometimes call her that too. One day, a new part-timer was scheduled to join us. When do we have an interview, I thought. I didn't remember seeing anything on the interview schedule. The manager mentioned the new hire, Jennifer, on her first day. Oh, Karen, starting today, we have a new part-timer, Jennifer Miller. Be sure to treat her well. Of course, but why is that? I asked. Actually, Jennifer is the daughter of Mr. James, the head of sales at headquarters. He called the other day and arranged for her to work here. So she got the job without an interview? I replied. I understand. But she will work just like everyone else, right? It doesn't matter who she is. As long as she does her job properly, there's no problem. However, Jennifer turned out to be a troublemaker. On her first day, she was supposed to be in by 8.30 for the early shift. I was assigned to train her. I hoped she would quickly learn stocking and cashier duties. But 15 minutes after her start time, she still hadn't arrived. I checked with the manager to see if there had been any contact from her, but there wasn't. Shall I try calling her? I asked. Well, it's her first day. Let's wait a bit longer, he replied. And another ten minutes passed, and Jennifer finally showed up, just five minutes before the store opened. She was in her twenties, but looked like a college student, complete with cute nails. Despite being late, she didn't seem flustered at all. Jennifer, what happened? Was there an accident? I was worried and asked. No, nothing, she said, not showing any remorse. You know you were supposed to be here by 8.30 for the early shift, right? Oh, was I? Sorry, I'll be careful next time, she replied casually. I thought, is she not reflecting on her actions at all? Anyway, let's make sure she learns her job properly, I decided. So I started explaining how to stock shelves. But isn't it already opening time? So most of the work is done, right? I guess there's nothing for me to do today, she said, not really listening. 
It was then that Grandma Mary, who had just finished stocking and returned to the back room, chimed in. Are you the new part-timer? she asked. Listen to the staff explaining things to you. Good luck, she encouraged Jennifer. Grandma Mary wasn't scolding her. She was just her usual cheerful self, giving advice. But Jennifer muttered, What's with that old lady? I don't need any advice from a regular old woman. At that moment, I just thought, is this how young people are these days? Right after their first encounter, Jennifer seemed to start seeing Grandma Mary as an enemy. For the next day, Jennifer stopped being late, but her work was far from commendable. She kept playing with her phone and never took the initiative to start any tasks. I spoke to the manager about it, but he was known for avoiding conflict. Oh, Jennifer, don't worry. I'll talk to her. Just keep doing your job as usual. Will you really talk to her? I doubted him. Look, Karen, I told you before, Jennifer is Mr. James's daughter. We don't want any trouble that might get us in trouble with other stores. So just don't cause any problems, okay? Cause any problems? But even if she's the daughter of someone important, if she's earning money, she needs to work properly. This is hopeless, I thought, as the situation continued to deteriorate. Jennifer started acting more and more entitled, even though she didn't do her job. Since the manager allowed it, no other staff member corrected her. On the contrary, Jennifer started bragging about her father being a department head and began pushing her tasks onto others. Other staff, not wanting to get fired, started doing what Jennifer asked. Some even acted like psychophants, trying to stay on her good side. But even in that environment, Grandma Mary was the only one who treated Jennifer normally. Hey, old lady, are you bored? Great, could you stock that shelf for me? Jennifer asked, pushing her tasks onto Mary. What are you talking about? If you don't do it yourself, you won't learn how to organize things. If you need help, I'll teach you, but go ahead and give it a try, she advised calmly. Grandma Mary's presence was reassuring to me. Meanwhile, Jennifer seemed increasingly irritated with Mary for not giving her special treatment. One day, an incident occurred. Grandma Mary and I entered the locker room for lunch and saw that her locker was open and its contents were spilled onto the floor. Scattered on the floor were her wallet, notebook, and lunchbox. The latter with its contents spilled everywhere. Seeing the spilled food, I immediately recognized it as Grandma Mary's frugal cooking. <gasps> this is terrible. Mary, please check if anything's missing. Who could have done this? I exclaimed. As I said this, Jennifer and another staff member walked into the locker room. What happened here? Wow, this is tragic. Jennifer sneered. And it smells too. Ugh, such pitiful food scattered all over. Oh dear, I'm sorry. It looks like my things fell out of my locker, and my lunch tipped over too, Mary said lightly. Oh, so it's your lunch, Grandma. No wonder it smells like old people's food, Jennifer laughed. Hurry up and clean it up. I need to eat my lunch too, and I can't relax with this mess around, she continued. Excuse me, I was about to scold her, but Mary gently grabbed my arm and spoke up instead. You're right, it's lunchtime after all. I'll clean this up right away she said, calmly starting to clean up. I helped her clean up quickly, then I asked, Mary, what will you do for lunch now? I have some chips if you want. Those are your lunch, dear. You should eat them, or you won't have energy for the afternoon. I'll go buy something now. Thank you for helping, she said, smiling. As she left the room, I heard Jennifer mutter, So annoying. This sort of bizarre behavior continued three more times, with Mary cleaning up and Jennifer making snide comments each time. I spoke to the manager about it. Isn't it strange that Mary's belongings are scattered on the floor every time? Someone must be doing this, I said. Oh, Mary's things just fell out, right? She's an elderly woman after all. Maybe she didn't put them back in properly, he laughed. But it's strange that it happens every time. Don't you think someone is behind this? I asked, frustrated. Oh, you're overthinking it. Besides, we don't want to cause any trouble with Mr. James's daughter around. Let's just keep things smooth, he said dismissively. Keep things smooth? I'm bringing this up because there is already trouble, I thought, losing hope in the manager. Who could be doing this, I wondered. The answer seemed obvious, but there was no proof. Then one day I stumbled upon a surprising opportunity. I entered the locker room during a bathroom break before lunch and sensed someone was inside. It was before lunch break, so the early shift should have already left. Could I be catching the locker vandal in the act, I thought, activating my phone's camera and opening the door quietly. And there was Jennifer, standing in front of Mary's locker, fiddling with something. Crash! I heard something fall. I looked down and saw Mary's bag contents scattered on the floor. She had tipped the bag upside down, spilling everything out. Then she kicked the lunchbox, muttering, That old lady is such annoying. Got you, I exclaimed, confronting Jennifer. Jennifer, it was you all along. 
She turned around in shock, her eyes wide and her face different from her usual expression. Oh, Karen, what are you doing here? She stammered. I just happened to come in, I replied. But what's going on here? You've been doing this all along, haven't you? I pressed. Well, yes, but please forgive me. I won't do it again, she said, smiling sheepishly. Isn't that old lady just a nuisance? She's so old and still working part-time. Doesn't that mean she was useless before? She continued. I mean, don't you think it would be better if she wasn't here? What do you say? Mary's a valued staff member. I shot back. Is this how you treat people you don't like? I'm going to tell the manager and make sure you apologize to Mary properly. Oh, really, Karen? She sneered, her face changing into a threatening expression. Do you think that's a good idea? My dad could have you fired in a snap. Enough, I said firmly. I've recorded everything you did just now on my phone. I'll show this evidence to the manager and report it to the headquarters. Just then, the lunch break started and Mary walked in. I was about to speak up, but Jennifer was quicker. I saw Karen do it, she accused. Before I could respond, Jennifer ran out, saying, "I'm going to tell the manager." I couldn't just leave Mary alone. Mary, it wasn't me. It was Jennifer. I have proof. I explained. It's okay. I believe you. Mary smiled, even before seeing the evidence. Were you trying to stop Jennifer from me? She asked. Of course. It's awful to see this happening. You're just doing your job. I see. Mary nodded. But this will only cause you trouble. Before Jennifer tells the manager, you should show him the proof. She advised. You're right. I agreed. Heading to the manager's office. But Jennifer had already gotten there first and was fake crying in front of the manager. Karen, I heard what happened. You were the one doing this in the locker room, right? The manager said calmly. Do you really believe that? I asked, stunned. Sir, trust me. No matter how much of a full timer she is, is it right for her to treat a part timer like this? Jennifer whined. I'll tell my father about this. She threatened again. Sir, Jennifer is the culprit. I have proof. I insisted, showing him the images on my phone. Let me see," the manager said, taking my phone and looking at the images. But then I heard a click. "Hmm? There's no such image," he said, looking confused. I quickly grabbed my phone back and checked, only to find the images had been deleted. "Did you delete the proof?" I asked the manager. "What are you talking about? I didn't do anything," he said defensively. "Did you lie about having proof and now want to blame me for deleting it?" "Yeah, Karen. That's really cruel of you," Jennifer added, pretending to cry again. Right, we might have to report this to headquarters, but maybe Mr. James won't say anything if Jennifer forgives you. How about it, Jennifer? He asked, looking at her. Jennifer lifted her face from her fake crying and smirked. Yeah, if she apologizes and changes her attitude from now on, maybe it's fine. Great. Then Karen, apologize here and now. If you don't, you might have to quit today. He threatened. What? Why should I quit when I've done nothing wrong? I asked, enraged. This manager just wants to please Mr. James. I realized. I'm so angry I could scream, but I can't just quit out of spite. But apologizing would be unbearable. I can't let this brat win. Just then, a knock came at the door. Manager, wait a moment," said a firm voice. To my surprise, it was Mary. She wasn't smiling like usual. Mary stood tall, exuding a commanding presence. The manager seemed taken aback by Mary's unusual demeanor as silence filled the room. Oh, Mary! I heard from Jennifer that Kara's been harassing you, right? The manager tried to explain. Sir, the culprit behind the locker incidents is not Karen. Mary declared. The real culprit is Jennifer. She said with authority. What? The manager and Jennifer were both stunned. What's this old lady talking about? Jennifer yelled, showing her true colors, trying to make herself look important. I'll make you pay. She threatened. Silas. Mary ordered, glaring sharply at the manager. Everyone was frozen by Mary's intensity. Jennifer is indeed the locker vandal. I saw it with my own eyes, and Karen took a video as proof. She continued. What? The manager and Jennifer both looked even more shocked. The video has already been sent to the HR department at headquarters. Mary revealed. What? You sent it to the headquarters? The manager gasped. This store's wrongdoing is not known. She said firmly. Actually, before I gave the proof to Mary for safekeeping, I recalled. Just in case, I thought it would be better to inform the victim, Mary. After all, I had no idea it would be useful in this way. And I didn't miss what you said earlier, sir. You said you sent it to headquarters, referring to the proof images. So you must have seen the evidence. I pressed again. Uh, well, um, the manager stuttered. I heard everything you said earlier, right outside the office. Mary added. I recorded it and sent it along with the video. She stated firmly. 
The manager was speechless. Oh, come on, he muttered under his breath. Jennifer, still not grasping the situation, said, Manager, contact HR and tell them it was a mistake. If you do that, everything will be fine, she insisted. The manager picked up the phone to try, but Mary stopped him. That's unnecessary. They should be arriving soon, she said calmly. Arriving who? Everyone wondered. Right then, there was a knock at the door. Mary nodded, and two men walked in. The manager gasped. Oh, Mr. Smith from HR, why are you here? Mr. Smith was the head of HR, someone store staff rarely interacted with. He was a man in his fifties with well-groomed silver hair, looking every bit like a capable executive. Another person with him seemed to be an HR staff member. I wondered why such high-ranking people had come here. Hello, everyone. We came here urgently to do reports of unfair treatment at this store. But why did he come so urgently, I wondered. Still thinking he could talk his way out, the manager said, Oh yes, we've had some locker incidents. It seems there's a disagreement between Kara and Jennifer about who's responsible. Enough with the lies. We know everything, Mary interrupted with a stern voice. Mr. Smith nodded gravely in agreement. Oh no, the manager muttered, realizing he was caught. Jennifer, still clueless, said to Mr. Smith, Nice to meet you. I'm Jennifer James, daughter of Mr. James from the sales department. I'm innocent, right? She added, clueless about the seriousness. Is she really saying this to the head of HR? I thought, shocked. Only you think that, Mr. Smith replied, cutting down Jennifer's naive assumption. But I'm the daughter of a department head, she insisted. And so what? Mr. Smith said bluntly. You and the manager here are both employees, regardless of your family ties. To hear him speak to Jennifer like that, Mr. Smith is truly HR's top man, I thought. Sir, who is this guy? Jennifer asked, her voice pitiful. Jennifer, this person doesn't care about your connections, the manager admitted. What? Jennifer exclaimed, disbelieving. Wrapping up, Mr. Smith turned to the manager. We'll be conducting an investigation, he said. Karen, I'd like you to step in as acting manager while this is resolved, he announced. Me? Acting manager? I asked, surprised. Yes, you've shown good judgment and leadership. After completing a few trainings, we're looking to promote you to manager, he explained. I'd be honored. Thank you, I said. But there are still so many things I don't understand. Mr. Smith, why was this resolved so quickly, and why did you arrive so fast? I asked. He glanced at Mary. All thanks to her, he said. Mary? Everyone turned to look at Mary, who just smiled. Why is Mr. Smith saying that about her? I wondered. Unable to hold back his curiosity, the manager asked. Mr. Smith, do you know Mary? Or is she a relative or something? Of course not, Mr. Smith replied calmly. Mary was our former CEO's wife. Mary was the former CEO's wife? I thought stunned, as did others. The CEO's wife? Why would someone like her be working as a part-timer? Jennifer blurted out. Mr. Smith turned to Jennifer and calmly explained. Mary works here by choice. Our store began as a small business, and she was one of its original staff members. Yes, it was tough back then, but I enjoyed it. I continue working to keep that spirit alive, Mary said. But Mary went through a normal hiring process, didn't she? The manager questioned. I did apply normally and was hired like anyone else, Mary confirmed. Of course, HR found out soon after. Mary never used her status as the former CEO's wife to exert any influence, Mr. Smith said. This is the first time we've ever had an issue like this. I just thought it was good to see Mr. Smith has grown so much, Mary said with a smile. And so the locker room incident was resolved. Jennifer quit before she could be officially reprimanded and moved away. I was promoted to acting manager a week later as Mr. Smith had suggested. Even though it's busier, it's much more fulfilling. Jennifer ended up at a rival store where she quickly earned a bad reputation and moved away with her family. Our former manager was transferred to a different store as a regular employee. Mr. James from headquarters was demoted to store manager due to his abuse of power. Since then, the company has focused on creating a transparent workplace environment. And Mary, she continues to work energetically at the store. I thanked her for everything she did, and she humbly replied, I didn't do anything special. I just reached out to an old acquaintance. And so, all was settled. Several years later, I joined the headquarters sales department. My work as a store manager had been recognized. Now I handle new manager training and inventory management. And while the work is different, it's still satisfying. Every day is fulfilling, just as Mary has said. You have to do what you want to do while you still can.